Good morning, everyone. This is the Friday the 13th, as someone just pointed out, meeting of the elementary school building committee. And I think instead of it being bad luck, it will be good luck, um, hopefully today. And seeing that we have a quorum, I'm going to call the meeting to order, but I first need to make sure that everyone can hear and be heard because we're conducting this meeting virtually. Uh, by Zoom, and the recording will be posted. So I'm just going to call people's names out in the order I see them on the screen. Uh, Mike? Here. Jonathan? Here. Tammy? Here. Rupert? Here. Ben? Here. Paul? Present. Phoebe? Good morning. Angelica? Here. Alicia. Here. Simone. Here. And Sean. Here. And um, Kathy, like I said, I'm going to have to leave in about 15 or 20 minutes. Um, I just want to join so you could get quorum, but it seems like Paul's here. So. Um, okay, great. Okay. okay. Um, did I miss anyone? Angelica, did I call you? Yes. Okay. So if I miss anyone, please just raise your hand as I went around the screen because the, the tiles reor reorganize themselves when people join. So I'm, I'm going to turn the meeting over to Margaret. Um, I think you all received um, two mailings directly from her. One was the uh, reconcile cost estimates with a potential list of alternative design choices. And then yesterday there was another list. Um, so Margaret, I'll let you explain it. And the one item I wanna add to the very end of the meeting and anyone who's not here, I will poll, is both Paul and, and Mike have said they can't join us next Friday at 8.30 in the morning. So I'm gonna see whether we can find another time, um, um, either later on Friday or on Thursday, because I think we're going to need that meeting. Um, so I'll do that after we see how far we get today. Margaret. OK, <clears throat> so I'm going to pull up the agenda uh, briefly. Oh, we have disabled screen share. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. How do I? I don't know why. I don't remember to check this right when I sign off. Do I have to enable it? Sean, do I enable the specific person? If you go down, to, yeah, where it says sh uh, share screen, um, you could just, I think it says allow panelists to share or something like that. Just click that. Uh, multiple participants can share. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Thank you. So can everybody see that? <clears throat> um, I can. <laughs> I'll, I'll okay. ask. I'm at guessing least. if you can see it. Um, Everybody else can see it. So this is the agenda. Happy New Year, everybody. Um, we're going to do a couple of things here this morning. So I'm going to give a, once I've, we've looked at the agenda, I'm going to give a little bit of an introduction to where we are in the process. Then we're going to go through the revised value engineering list that um, Danisco sent out. Well, I sent out. Danisco created and I sent out um, last night and is now in the packet. So it's an updated list from Monday that includes some more thorough pricing. What we want to do in looking at that is determine if there's anything on that list that the committee does not want to do. Um, then we're going to have a brief discussion about what if there are other items that we should be considered for cost savings. Then I am going to give an overview of the total project budget, um, which is a sort of larger budget that includes the soft costs, and talk a little bit about the reimbursement. We're, we are going to have a more detailed discussion about that at a later date, but it's to give you a flavor for where it stands right now. And then we'll talk through next steps, which includes um, the meeting that's coming up with council as well as the community forums. And then we have three invoices at the end to review. So that I'm going to take this down. We did something very strange to my screen um, and just sort of recap that give my intro. So, you know, as I described to you in the memorandum I sent out earlier this week, we 
uh, the first week of January, we received both invoices. We had a long, it actually turned out to be an eight hour reconciliation. Um, both uh, estimates were above where they had, uh, where we had been at the PSR. Although as a reminder, the PSR estimates are really to sort of get a basis of comparison of cost. Um, but we recognize that, you know, the we really needed to get it down somewhat. So there's been a, a very positive and engaged effort involving all of the consultants. Um, I haven't contributed much. I really wanna give Denisco and their team a lot of credit for this. Um, and that resulted in the estimates I sent out um, with my memorandum. As I said in the memo, there are really, in my opinion, three big things that are reflected in the cost increase. So one is that, there was a larger than anticipated escalation between over the past six months since we did the last estimate. That has prompted us to be more conservative about uh, including escalation going forward. And the reason for that is that the basis of this, that what happens with this number when it's finalized is it becomes the basis for your funding agreement. And we want to use a conservative number um, in order to protect the community. If the cost goes up later, um, the MSBA is, they're, they're, not in, they're not in the room um, sorting that out. Um, and then I think the third reason was that as the team had an opportunity to really dig into the implications of the site and making this a really functional site, the, that process and the costs associated with it have turned out to be somewhat complex. And I say that because if you take the estimate, uh, the estimates that we've given you, and you look back at the PSR estimates, there's a there's a pretty substantial uptick in that number. So there's there's upticks in other unit costs throughout the estimate, but that that's a big one. And we know that this we we know that the there is real value in developing the site. So I'm not making an argument against, against that. I'm just saying that um, I think now we really sort of sussed out what the cost of that is. So um, the next step, and this is a, a typical next step in every project, is then to look at whether we can find cost reductions without changing, as Donna has said several times, the function, the, the appearance, or the educational programming fit for the project. So the list that we're about to go over is that list. It's a list that's been developed by the uh, design team and their consultants. And I'm gonna, with that introduction, just I wanna ask if there are any other questions about this before I turn it over to Tim to go through the list. Uh, Sean. I see Sean. Uh, Margaret, I know the, the cost estimates kind of stole the show, but I don't know if we met since MSBA approved their changes and it may be worth at some point going over what MSBA did, um, yeah. you know, in large part from the advocacy from Amherst, um, which, you know, it's 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 not uh, going to absorb all of the higher costs from the cost estimates, but it's going to make it not, yeah. as pain, not as painful <clears throat> as it would otherwise be. No, thank you, Sean. So yes, the MSBA met on the 21st. And when we get when we get to, when the floor comes back to me and we look at the total project budget, I'm going to talk about it a little bit. But I will say the MSBA did raise the cap on construction a significant amount. It's by no means, it's not the full amount of what this project is costing or any other projects are costing, but it has helped the bottom line in terms of the reimbursement. So we'll come back to that and I'll sort of show you what that looks like at that stage. Any other hands? Yeah. Kathy's. Uh, yeah, just a quick um, one, Margaret. Um, when you said as the, and Tim can be answering this too, as you got in more toward um, the actual site, the dirt, the mud, the water, whatever, you know. The clay. The, the clay, <laughs> the clay. Um, you know, what I, what I saw, if I did a quick look going backwards, things like aggregate pier went up by a lot. Some of the, uh -huh. is that all because you had better information, you had more and better information and how much of that was unit costs? And I don't need an exact, because it looked to me like unit costs of almost everything went up a lot, but then some of the things sort of jumped up. 
Um, Tim, why don't you, can you, is there a brief answer to that question? Yeah, I just want, uh, I, I just, the, you know, just. The brief uh, answer is it's mostly unit cost, but there is a little of both. There, there is much more detailed information that was provided to the cost estimator. So there are some quantities that went up or were better understood, which um, developed the cost since um, PSR. But, you know, a large bulk of this, and it's across um, trades, across all of the materials, across all of the aspects of the project, there is just broad-based escalation that uh, has increased the price of just about everything involved. And uh, Kathy, I think you asked about the site in particular, and there was more testing and investigation done on the site. And I think we had RAM aggregate peers in at uh, PSR, one of the items that was I think you think of as being added to the mix was also preloading the building footprint, which was a new number. There was a, a basically another tactic involved to basically pre-settle the existing soil. So that was a straight add. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, I mean, just to I I also um that's a really good example, Rick. Um, you know, I think as they dug into it, um, the soils are so poor that in order to get a sort of su sufficient kind of compressed base for the building, they're going to have to load the, they're going to have to clear and load, like put a big pile of dirt on the area where the new building will be built for several months in order to make sure that they have sufficient compaction. So. Um, I, I agree, I, Rick, I think, and Tim, that's a great summary. There, there was more information, was definitely a piece of this, but there were also um, increase in costs. So I don't see any more hands, um, and I want to get into what I think is really the, the meat of the conversation today. So uh, Tim, are you, the, are you the fearless leader here? I, 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 yeah, <laughs> I am going to share the list uh, and we're going to go through it uh, because it's a lengthy mm -hmm. list. We're not going to go back and forth between the drawings and explain every item. But at the end, uh, we're going to walk through the materials as you've seen them. And there have been some small tweaks, but uh, let's just start with the list and we can start going through item by item and give an explanation and answer any questions as we go through. Is this zoomed in appropriately. I know you all have this, but I uh, just want to make sure that you can read the items as we're going down. Yep. Tim, the only other thing um, I'd like to point out is that as we spent hours looking at ways to reduce costs, we reached out to all of our consultants with um, their eyes on their trades, which was extremely helpful. Uh, we have identified um, in green where it says team recommended, where we're recommending a um, change in the drawings or in the in the project, and where we we say no, where we feel that um, that there it's it's a detriment to the project. So I just in in the green column, and then what we've done is, of course, we we tallied it over under accepted. There are some potentials that may impact operations, may impact um, some, some other areas that we felt it was an hour call to judgment call on, on your part, whether you wanna take those or not. So um, the ones that we're saying yes to, we feel have no compromises to the overall project. We'll walk through them and then we can go forward. Um, you could probably make it bigger. Yeah, there you go. All right, so they're broadly categorized, categorized by site, building exterior, building interior, and then mechanical systems. So we're going to start with the site. Um, the first item on the list is replacing concrete sidewalks, um, essentially the paved area around the building with uh, bituminous uh, blacktop. Um, it's a nearly as durable uh less expensive material um but there are considerations in terms of uh maintenance or minor considerations eventually the blacktop will have to be resealed and things like that but uh it is a significant savings with uh, minimal impact on uh the function of the building so we think this one should be accepted 
Tim, Tim, could I just interrupt Kathy and Margaret? Do you, would you like us to pause after each item or go through the entire list and let, let people ask questions? I'd like you to do a category at a time and then okay. ask questions. Perfect. Perfect. Because I think several of them are knit together. So you're better off doing a category okay. at a time. Okay, so so we've organized this, um, and I I don't want to say I apologize. Um, we, you know, to the wire last night, still scouring, um, and and didn't want to leave any stone unturned. So we know you received this a little bit late last night, or the updated one. We've organized it by site, by architectural, which really doesn't come into play necessarily here. Um, and then and the mechanical, electrical, et cetera. So we'll go through the site first and then pause. Uh, the next item uh, uh, is eliminating the curb at the west side of the parking lot. The parking lot slopes as a whole to drainage features on the east side. Um, so the curbs on the west side are not doing anything in terms of directing water. Uh, they are the wheel stop for the car, um, so they have some function in that way. They would, if without a curb on the west side, it would be a little bit easier to push the snow off in the winter. Um, so there, there are some things to think about both ways. Um, we've listed that as a potential because um, we'd like to hear uh, Rupert's and facilities uh, thoughts on that before we put it into the accepted column. Um, the next item are is blue stone in the rain garden. So the rain gardens uh, at the east of the building have uh, blue stone pavers in them uh, that would allow it a little easier for kids to walk and really get into them as they're doing their outdoor learning in those uh, environments. What this does is replaces those larger blue stone pavers with um, Gravel, which is still a walkable surface. Neither of those are technically accessible, but there is a stone dust path and a wood platform at one of the rain gardens that would include this area and make it accessible uh, so that everyone could be involved with learning at these features. Um, the next item is delete unit pavers. There were two areas, one at the um, main entrance of the building and another at the outdoor learning and uh, planter garden south of the building where we had unit pavers um, mixed in with the sidewalk. Uh, it's a, it's a, a nicer, I don't want to use the word, it's a, it's a different paving material that allowed us to mark entry and, and a significant happening going on site, but there are other ways that we can achieve that within design and it is a, an uptick in cost, so we um, eliminated that and we'll use normal paving in those areas. The next one is with all of the earthwork that's happening on site, the preloading, the stripping off the existing topsoil, there's going to be an excess of fill that based on the testing that we have, the topsoil is not of a quality that we think uh, it could be sold, uh, uh, which is usually worked into the general contractor's bid. Uh, so therefore, if they cannot sell it, they would have to pay to dispose of it offsite. If there is an opportunity for the town to accept this topsoil, possibly some clay-like soil, um, that would be a savings to the overall project if that opportunity exists within the town. The next item is to take the building itself and lower the first floor elevation one foot. If the building is one foot lower, there's one foot less of earth that has to be brought into the site under the building itself and in the surrounding areas to make the grades work. Um, the way that this location of the building on the uh, site works, it slopes down to the east. So at the west side of the building, you would still be about three feet above the um, groundwater table. Uh, which is obviously a concern and has been driving, uh, keeping the building above the existing first floor elevation this whole time. But uh, even with moving it down one foot from the 178 elevation where it is currently designed, uh, we would still be above the uh, groundwater and all of the drainage layers and uh, permeable fill that we have under the building would remain that would break all of the capillary action. So we feel that you would still be protected from groundwater. 
the next item is to uh, delete one full-size basketball court. Uh, this is a potential. Um, and we, um, uh, it you know, could have an impact on the use of the site and how heavily it's used during PE and uh, recess. Uh, so we put this in the potential category. And I realize that I haven't been uh, reading the uh, values associated with all of these. Some of them are quite large and some less. And obviously that will uh, play a large part in the decision whether or not to accept them. But removing the basketball court is uh, about $50,000, 55. Uh, the next one is to delete the play surface between the two structured play areas. It is the soft uh, surface that will be usable year round uh, that will allow a soft um, recess area, uh, regardless of the weather. Um, and we did not include this uh, because we know how important that is uh, to have an outdoor recess where kids can play year round, uh, regardless of the weather, but it is, um, a lot big ticket item, so we felt the need to put it on the list at two hundred and seventy thousand dollars after markups. Um, the next item is uh, birdhouses that were included in the estimate. Um, they're a part of outdoor learning, um, and and they certainly can be interesting. But there are other ways to achieve that, so we included that, and it's also a small dollar item at five thousand dollars. And the last item in sight is uh, to uh, sharpen the pencil on the number of parking spaces we have. Uh, we believe the count is right, but um, as we really get into it and see what the staffing and visitor levels are, uh, there is an opportunity to reduce paving. So it's not a big ticket item, but for every space that you eliminate, uh, you, you would be saving $1,000. So um, maybe what we could do is bring up, well, if anyone has any questions, but we have the site plans, we have um, images so that it might be helpful for people to see what we were talking about. If anyone has any questions related to any of those items, I'm sure people do. We're hoping people do. <laughs> I see Paul, Kathy and Rupert, and I'm gonna start with Rupert. <laughs> okay. I think I've unmuted. Up the, yeah. Yeah. There you um, go. So uh, the curb on the west side, can you show where that is? That's along that edge there. That would be oh. this. Yes, it would be from the north edge to the south edge of the parking lot. And that for the entire parking lot, that is the uphill side. So it sheets to rain stormwater management features on this side. Understood. Um, one of my concerns will be uh, cars uh, trying to get up onto that grassy area um, deliberately. Uh, and I'm wondering if there's ways uh, that you see that that might be discouraged uh, given your perspective. Um, what we currently have priced is a vertical granite curb, which is, um, at the high end of curbs, there are either slope granite or asphalt curbs that could be used. Those are not as durable for plowing, uh, but they will achieve a wheel stop. So there is a middle ground between accepting this entire um, item at $35,000 instead of taking the whole value, possibly half. To it, so you still have some of that wheel stop ability. Uh, yeah, notice Tim didn't mention wheel stops which i'm sure most people that have to deal deal with them know are losers in this situation just from a quality standpoint uh cape cod burr might be uh a middle ground tim i i asked you to take down the chart did we recommend this or not this was a potential correct this was a potential yeah. yeah, I would. Um, am I still muted? No, I'm not. No, no, nope. we hear you. Yeah, so I mean, I'd love love to check in with uh, our plow drivers um, and continue the conversation. Maybe we can. Uh, I can get back to you with an email or something. Yep. Um, so, so the potentials or whatever. So that's great. Thank you, Rupert. And and a lot of some of the other items are. You know, we're we're not asking necessarily for. Um, final decisions today. I think what might be helpful is 
if everyone says, yep, that's a no brainer, that's great. If, if people want to think about things, we understand um, that there are, I'll use the word impacts to some of the items. And that's why we chose not to take them. Um, that that's totally fine. I don't, we're not asking people to make a decision today. So thank you. Rupert, is that it or, and can, for you, or did you have anything else? Um, uh, well, in terms of the, um, the rain garden, uh, bluestone, um, is that an area that you're imagining, uh, we would be clearing in the winter time and, uh, what's your take on, uh, snow blowers on, uh, gravel surface? Uh, it is not an area that would be cleared. Anywhere that would be cleared is either uh, well, it, would, it would be concrete or, or bituminous paving. You would not be clearing um, anything that is gravel, blue stone. So, Tim, why don't you point out those areas? And these are kind of the depression areas that are um, also being yeah, utilized as our stormwater management. Yeah, the, the sort of unnatural blue areas, uh, and there would be no, they're, they're sloped a little bit. Um, there's no snow clearing that happens there. Rupert, you're all set. Um, and then I guess um, uh, lowering the site sure sounds like uh, an anx anxiety making thing uh, for a 50 year plan on a wet site. Um, uh, I just want to express my hesitancy on that one. And then I, now I think I'm done. So um, let's, I have a feeling Rupert's not the only person who has, wants to talk about that. So let's come back to talking about that. I want to hear from uh, Paul, Kathy, and uh, Jonathan. So Paul, you're up. Yep, so I have three things. One is, I just want better clarification, Donna. Are you looking for us to say yes or no in a preliminary level today, or are you just informing us and getting sort of some feedback? It would be great uh, if if we did have people in agreement um, with, with whatever items that we feel are appropriate. And okay. then, so, yeah. so, so to make this efficient, if anybody disagrees with what you have, they should call it out, and if there, if it says yeah. so, we should try to come to a conclusion. Exactly, that would be helpful. Okay, yeah. good. Uh, second, on the um, uh, removing the waste and putting it someplace on town land, um, that's a possibility. It's not a guarantee. We could certainly explore that. We would need to know the material that's coming out and the um, number of cubic yards that we're talking about. Um, there is one or two possibilities of town-owned sites that we might be able to utilize. Um, so that, that's a definite possibility. Um, my third is on the potential on the basketball court. I would argue, I, I, I would re re reiterate my previous point as a basketball player, you usually like to see your basketball courts side by side because that's how people socialize and operate. They don't walk across dis distances. So I still think they should be, I, I would argue that we should have paired and they should be connected. So those are my three points. But you're you're suggesting keeping it. You're not. Keep, keep it, yes. Okay. Yeah. And and thank you. We will um, make those modifications. The other the other thing, I guess, maybe what I'd like to say is this is uh, at the end of schematic design, and so the next phase is design development. And so I don't want anyone to think that we're done with design. I. I um, our cost estimators and and our graphics indicate that like we're going to go out to build tomorrow, but but that's far from where we're at. So we will continue all of those conversations. But but Paul, thank you. We'll make that adjustment. And do you know how much material we're talking about in terms of trucking? Or you can just I, tell me. I I think the estimator did have a number that, that we we'd have to dig up. Okay, yeah. just let me yeah. know. He, I mean, he he talked about he was the one who raised this possibility because um, you know it's an interesting detail. His this is now I'm talking here about uh, Pete Timothy. So what he said was that it was completely possible in the sort of bidding environment that a contractor would actually find someone to sell it to. We wouldn't see that, but if they didn't have 
sell, find someone to sell it to, he felt we should be carrying a value for moving it. Um, and he had done the calculation and he said it was a little bit belt and suspenders, but that's why the number is in there. So we, that we can dig that up, Paul. Uh, okay, Kathy. Uh, take, why don't you take Jonathan and Mike first? Okay, Jonathan. I'm, I'm not muted. Okay, I was just going to say that on that last topic of the of the fill, um, there's at least one processor in town um, who might be interested in. It. I don't. I cannot speak for them. So I, I it would be great if the town has a place to put it. But I think we should also make sure that we can't um, give, give it, it away for free. <laughs> <laughs> Jonathan, um, who's the who is the processor? Uh, I do know that Wagner Wood, further up, uh, was that Northeast Street, pr produces things like you know compost and mulch and topsoil. They also process wood chips. I can't say that they would use it, but it wouldn't hurt to reach out. They're you know a mile up the road. <coughs> That's a very short trucking distance. Okay, great, thanks, Mike. Yeah, so I just wanted to comment. Uh, it's not a yes, no on, on the changes to the outdoor play spaces. I totally get it. I'm not going to say no here because um, I get the, the larger piece. I just wonder if the player we're hoping to be all year is grass. Does that, and I'm not looking for an immediate answer, but did that, does that change how we think about how we orient where the play spaces are? Um, because it's sort of like grass adjacent to grass. Um, so I'd be interested in a future conversation about if, if that change occurs, how we think a little differently about the outdoor spaces and where the playgrounds are and where quote unquote playing fields are, um, because it would change my perspective on that aspect. And I'm sad, but we're all sad about lots of these things and, and I get it. I'm also, you know, I get the larger picture here. So, um, you know, uh, that's my two cents. Thank you. Yeah, so Mike, we currently have that as a potential. We're not um, at this point um, taking it where we arrived at the $5.1 million. But, you know, would we like to see more than 5 million? Sure, right? But, um, and so again, if that is the committee's desire to put that in the yes column, again, as part of design development, we would, we would continue to explore that. Okay, I see Phoebe's hand is up now as well. Kathy, do you want to go or you want to give it to Phoebe? Go to Phoebe first. I'll go. I'll go last. Okay, Phoebe. Um. Okay. Thanks. So. Um. And I had to step away briefly, so I'm hoping this is not, uh, you know, doubling up on something somebody else said. Um. I just had a question about the parking spaces thing. Um, are we talking about the amount of space for parking, decreasing that? Is that what that means? Or is that, you know, physical actual spaces? Um, so that's my first question. And then in terms of the play space, I would agree that, you know, uh, so I, I agree that we probably have to look at that. And I also uh, sort of agree, uh, was thinking about Mike's concerns as well, um, and wonder in terms of, I, I wanna put that in a little bit of a different light as well, in terms of accessibility. Um, so if that is going to be grass and we're still hoping for year round use, um, I'm wondering about location and having it accessible year round for, for kids to use, um, but um, also just uh, accessibility in general, uh, upkeep, all of those kinds of things. So if we can figure that out. And then can I ask sort of a more process question? Um, because I, I want to go through these category by category, but I'm trying to remember to go back to where we, uh, were to the timeline, um, because I know that the site work had far less in terms of percentages of, uh, how sort of over what we were looking at in June site work is quite a bit less than, than building. So I'm just wondering, you know, when we go through all of this and we talk about all of these things, how much do we talk about them? And when do we actually start to make the decisions about it? Um, because I want to be weighing, you know, site work, building work, all of that kind of stuff, if that makes sense. Thanks. Um, so this is totally open dialogue, right, Kathy and Margaret? We should. Yeah. Okay. So 
why don't we start in order, I guess, parking spaces. Yeah, we, it's, it's a potential. It's just something we threw out um, that it would be a reduction. In of number, space. reduction of number, not reduction so there, of size. There's, an, there's 170 parking spaces and we're saying typically that that's a lot for 575 students, but we recognize that doesn't include all the special needs and the associated staff to support the program. So we're just throwing it out um, as, as a potential. We have vetted this in the past, so we, you know, think it's pretty spot on, um, but, but we just thought we would throw it out there. So that was the number of parking spaces. Um, the play space as it relates to accessibility, it, it would be accessible, um, right? It's going to be at the same grade, just like it, you would be accessible to access the fields to the north of this. Um, does it get muddy? Yeah, it's grass, um, right? So with with all of those... Um, We're still uh, carrying the sub-drainage if it's grass. Yes. The but you know, in the winter, you know, is there is there a concern? You can't plow it in the winter, right? Um, so so those things. And then as oh, looking at each of the values, um, we it, you'll see actually, Tim, I know I'm gonna ask you to toggle back and forth. Can you bring up the cost, the VE list? So if you go to the bottom, or maybe you can sum up the site, there is significant savings in the site. And we tried to look at what the, uh, we didn't, can you sum them up just by going to the accepted column and just see how much that is. You'll see that there really is significant amount of savings in site. Um, we did not prioritize any one item. We we looked at this holistically and we said, okay, uh, we think that all of these items, it's right at the bottom. That's $500,000. There's a sum down there at the bottom. Um, we, we looked at this holistically and said, okay, what can we do that, again, would not alter the um, intent of the project, whether it's site, whether it's program, whether it's ops. That's why we had some as potentials because we didn't want to take some that um, may have potential impacts. So to say is site less important or more important than building, et cetera, we, we didn't really look at it that way. We looked at where are some big cost items that would uh, we could take a savings and not impact the overall intent of the project. So $500,000 in just what we're suggesting as yeses, that's not including the basketball, that's not including the um, the play area that, right, those, those are- um, That is also items. not including the reduction in floor elevation of one foot, which I moved to the potential column when I heard misgivings okay so that's five hundred thousand not including that mm -hmm. so that you know five hundred thousand is significant and and we don't feel that this is uh, a reduction in the value of what you'll be receiving does that help phoebe yeah i think so i i was i think i was uh in terms of the process more talking about not um uh, saying that one thing was more important than another, um, but that it, it looked like when I was trying to look at numbers and I have not had a chance to go through all this, it was a ton of information um, <laughs> in a few days. Um, but when I was looking at it, it looked like the site, you know, the, the increase there, sorry about the dinging, the increase there was about, you know, like 5% over what it was in June, the building was quite a bit more than that. Um, and so I was just trying to figure out, you know, I, I would like to go through all of it and see where the bulk of it is and then have the opportunity and make sure that we have the opportunity to come back and say, 
okay, well, yes, all of these things, you know, yes, yes, yes on all of these. And then it, it, that kind of thing. So it was, it was really more about process as opposed sure. to more important. Cause I think it's all important. Um, right. We have to make, we have to make, <laughs> so, so, I think you guys have recommended good things, you know, yeah. we have to make those. So decisions. I think, yeah. And I think what we'll say is kind of what Margaret said at the beginning, <clears throat> um, we were able to do a deeper dive on the site. Uh, we understood, given the soil conditions, that you know we were able to understand better what we needed to do to preload and do things like that. So um, there were some added costs based on the information, the added information we had. But what you'll see, and maybe Rick or Tim, I tried to pull it up. There were some significant increases in unit costs that were unintended or unanticipated, I shouldn't say unintended, unanticipated um, six months ago. And, and we can maybe highlight as we kind of go through this, the unit costs have increased significantly on some of these items that even, I mean, it's blowing minds of even these cost estimators that are doing this day in and day out. So, so it's, it, it's a little, I know you said it's only 5% on the site, more in the building. The building obviously is just a, a greater portion of the cost of the project, but um, there is some significant material costs in that. I, I guess, Phoebe, if I could add, yeah, the site didn't jump up. And when you get into the buildings, there were individual line items that might not have jumped up. <laughs> but given where the bottom number came, we looked at the entire project is an opportunity of saving money, even if something was right where it was earlier, is there an opportunity to save? Because there may be areas where we can't and we're stuck with whatever that price increase was. Yeah, thank you. Um, Margaret, I. Jonathan, do you have more to add or did your hand just not go up? No, no, I do actually, I meant to add one other item when I spoke okay. earlier. Um, I, I would like to encourage the design team to, to um, uh, sit down with, with Rupert and his team a little bit more on those curbs as well. Um, if I don't know the extent of vertical curb we have, um, but you really can use Cape Cod curb uh, fairly extensively. I, I know we may not want to do that where you might have a bus running into it. Or other things like that, but you know that's a, to me a place. Granite curbing is very expensive, and and it's possible that there might be more savings than that. And so I just like to encourage that to be looked at a little little bit more deeply. Okay, it's um I, I have a yeah, yeah. okay. So I'm not sure when we want to do this, Margaret. But on the site, I had a few other items that I just wanted to raise as a um, potential area to think differently about them. And given what Phoebe has also observed on where are we trying to cut, we're, we've got today, we've got next Friday, and we've got another Friday. So this is not a, we can have potential, carry potentials for a while in my mind as long, as, but we should eliminate. So I looked at planters. Um, planters we have 18 of them and i was thinking of things that the kids might be able to do as projects with the teachers that we could come back to later and that was a ninety thousand dollar number um there's uh, 50 log seats and 27 wool logs to sit on so i know that's part of the um, landscaping so i'm just wondering whether there's a potential to for some savings there because when i add that up before I do Tim's roll up of 29%, it's 155,000 with wood, lo wood logs, planters. And then um, on the playgrounds, this may be we have to have them, but we have uh, chain link French's around. One is what the way I read it is a 12 foot one and a four foot one. And that's in the $100,000 range. So I didn't know whether those are required and essential and whether we need both the 12 foot and the four foot. So one was just a question. Um, that's it on. Um, so I'm not, I don't have any, everyone else has already 
ask my questions about what you have on the list. These are things that you don't have on the list. So um, related to the planters, maybe you could bring up the, uh, actually we have the movie that might show the planters a little bit better, yeah. right, Tim? I don't uh, know they're up, we, okay. We, we do, but the planters are. Mm -hmm. These are quite they're... large planters, Kathy. Um, they're, we're carrying enough, I think for two classes to be out there simultaneously. Tim, there's like 40 yes. of them. So this is the outdoor learning area that certainly is a conversation with staff to see if all 40, you know, is that a nice to have? Do you really anticipate okay. using all 40 simultaneously or what the intent there is? But because um, that really was directed to outdoor learning, we felt it was important. These planters are large. They're, I, I don't, I don't think that students could go out and build them. We we did say, you know, the birdhouses could totally be okay. you know, a, a student thing, but these these are quite large. As do far you, as do, you, do you remember the raised planting beds at uh, Sunita Williams Cafe? Yeah, that, that's what these are. Okay, so, so that was a question. You've just, no, no, you've that's okay. Yeah, yep. You've and, answered the question. Yep, um, and, and log seats. That's another question to kind of circle back way. with Mike and those guys to see. Those are great for sitting. Um, I think we were trying to reuse the trees that are being cut down, right? To reuse the logs. Um, you know, could it be a Boy Scout or Girl Scout activity or something that they could provide? But I, again, we can revisit those as well. So you've highlighted those. You know, and it's just, I, I wasn't even thinking of eliminating them as much as could we get them less expensively? You know, do would people, can we use reuse our trees? Well, some of the people. So, and then the chain link fences, I didn't know whether those are required or not. Um, and so, yeah, the chain link fences, Tim, why don't you show where those are? For um, the play areas, right? Yes, so fences. for the play areas, there's a four foot fence that surrounds them, which um, are good for um, essentially keeping kids in the area. And then the 12 foot fences that you mentioned are typically behind backstops. Um, essentially keeping the ball from going into uh, down the slope into the uh, rain gardens or stuff like that. Okay. Uh, and then my my other question with Paul suggesting if you put the two basketball ports together rather than apart, that gives you an all weather surface that you could play on. It's not soft the way grass is, but it is it's potentially a play area. So I think redrawing that. Um, if we had to give up with the the green space, it's just it's the way I think about. I see kids doing all sorts of thing on basketball courts that's not always basketball, um, uh, and I realize that's not as nice as a soft surface. So it's just a when we come back to your list was one of my thoughts of keeping the two basketball courts, but put the, putting them side by side. It's the way up in Mill River in our recreation area. They're side by they've been side by side. Um, so. That's that's the end of my comments. And I see Alicia's hand. Alicia. Um, Alicia, um, we're not hearing you. Uh, did oh. she, I think, uh, let me just see whether she just disappeared. She disappeared. So, so I'll keep an eye out for her. Um, okay. When she, to when she reappears, we can grab her. Okay. Um, why don't I'm we ready. go on to the next bucket? Oh, actually, I'm sorry. So R Rupert, I, I put you off about the issue of the relative height of the site. And I think you were looking from the design team for some confidence that that was not going to be a detriment to the project. Danisco team, do you do you want to speak to that? And, uh, Ali, I, I want to see whether Alicia can um, unmute. And Alicia, are you back? And she does have her hand yes, up. Can back. you hear me? 
Yes. Now we can hear you. Yes. Okay. Sorry. I had this issue in finance committee the other day, so I just logged off and logged back on. Um, but I just wanted to state that I don't have any opposition to any of the suggestions that Denisco has made today. Um, I do, however, feel like I need a little bit more time to grapple with this. So I'm glad that Kathy said we'll have a couple of more meetings. So I guess my question is just more about process in terms of when we have to make the final decision on this document and what then happens. Um, so when we're looking at the fact that we have two different cost estimates, are we, are we uh, like basically what happens after this step? We say, okay, we're going to eliminate, uh, you know, the basketball court and we're going to eliminate this playground. And then do we send it back to somebody else? It, does this go straight to the MSBC? Uh, what happens? So Alicia, let me speak to that a little bit. So, um, you know, the purpose of the second estimate is to, really kind of challenge the designer's estimate. Um, typically, so the, all these cost savings have come from the design team working with their estimator, which is AM Fogarty. And we have not gone back to our estimator to align them, but we would do that once this all kind of settled down um, to make that cost effective. So um, I would say um, what we're looking for today, as Donna responded earlier to Paul, is that we're trying to get a sense of whether there are any of these things that are no's um, and whether there are other things we should be looking for. And what I expect will happen is that next week um, we will be we will give you an update on what we take away from this meeting. And I also think it's possible based on, you know, other um, comments from the community or from council, that there may be further tinkering with this. Um, I think right now we have the setup for a February 17th vote for the whole thing to go to the MSBA and it submitted to the MSBA on March 2nd. So if you go back and look at the agenda, you can sort of see the overview of those dates. Um, I think from council's perspective, it would probably be ideal if the committee could pretty much agree on what's in and what's out by the time we're making a presentation. Kathy, I think that's on the 23rd, right? Right. So, you know, so that's next Friday. As I said, we're going to try, may have to find another meeting time ne next Friday, but next week we have next another, week. Yeah. We have another whole meeting. We have scheduled a other, another whole meeting to go over um, anything we listed as potential or uh, as opposed to yeses um, and and then say that that's the list for now. Um, so that that at least in theory, we still have would have the 27th to also do it, Margaret, but it would be an initial cut would be done by next Friday, decided at next Friday. Alicia, does that give you enough information to kind of frame what you want to do? Um, yeah, I mean, I think that's more helpful, but I still am wondering, so will next Friday be the last time we have to discuss this before the council meeting, correct? It would be the last time before the council meeting, yes, but it won't be okay. the last time if the right. committee, so if the committee wants to take it up again. Okay, and so we don't have to make the decisions by then, but it would be nice so that we can pass those things to the council. I think it would be okay. make the process clearer for them. Okay, that is helpful. Thank you. All right. Um, so back to Denisco team. Do you want to respond to the issue about lowering the overall Rupert's question about low, lowering the overall elevation of the site? Um, we we can offer that um, there is you know no. Uh, change the experience of the site, which I don't think is the concern, but the systems that we have designed and put in place, the under slab drainage, uh, the drainage layer uh, will all still be in place. Um, the, the way this was designed, we took the existing building elevation and raised the new building two feet. Um, and the new building is south of the existing building where it's, it's a little bit lower than the existing building at the west side and it's considerably lower at the east side um, so the drainage layer that is under the building is um, directly below the building and then that is three feet 
above what was observed to be the high groundwater level through test pits. And then at the east side of the building, you would be six feet above. So, uh, you know, we have as much confidence in the system that we've designed, given that it's still the same system, it's still above groundwater, but obviously given the history and the concerns on the site, uh, it's a decision that has to be made and thought of, and um, you have all of the appropriate time to make that decision. I, I guess another way to look at it, and it, we put the range on there because at, at PSR in talking about uh, the issue of the site, <clears throat> we made a conceptual decision at a new finished floor elevation wherever the building went, and that was to get more daylight between the high water table and the new finished floor. So lowering it a foot would bring you from three feet to seven feet above the high water table. Not lowering it is four feet to eight feet. Uh, we wouldn't have ever been talking about seven or eight feet of depth as being a concern under design consideration. So it's really a value judgment of that, the value of that one foot of additional elevation where the water table's the closest. And that's, uh, as Tim says, the systems are in place to provide that break. And it, and it is a, it is a, comfort level but so rick i just to summarize so at psr you were you had it eight foot eight feet you said it at eight feet above the high water table. Oh, so the, the range here this building here if 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 we maintain the psr finished floor elevation the the finished floor above groundwater would be from four to eight feet by dropping, because the site slopes and the water table slopes, by dropping finish floor a foot to reduce the amount of fill here, that distance goes from three feet to seven feet. Seven or eight feet had never been a real concern. It's that three or four feet. So it's just trying to just show so, the overall so the, the, the minimum difference but high water table is right. three feet in the design you are proposing right and it was four feet and it was four feet okay yeah i was just trying to focus in on the minimum right because yeah. after that it only gets better right uh, alicia's hands back up you know Margaret, uh, I, think, I think leaving it as potential makes sense um which is what tim just did yeah alicia uh, yes, thank you, Kathy. Um, I'm wondering if you all can show the proposed fencing and if you have a diagram of that. Um, I think it would be helpful um, to really envision what that is supposed we do, to look like. We do not have a very close diagram. It's shown on the plan, but uh, uh, granted, it's it's somewhat uh, blurry, but it surrounds the um, structure play areas, the outdoor south play, and then around the basketball courts as backstops, there is fencing. A four foot okay. fencing. Correct. Four foot around the play, 12 foot. Four foot around the, the play, 12 feet behind the baskets. To, to prevent, you know, they're shooting hoops, it needs to go high. Um, chain link is, is what we're, so um, Alicia, I guess if you're trying to visualize what it looks like, right? Um, it's coded though. It's a coded chain link fence um, and, and you can pick certain colors. So it actually blends into the site and the environment. And you over, don't over time, it. we've gravitated toward brown as being the, the less obvious. Right. But, but to, to, so from a functionality perspective, this is Probably we don't have this on the list, right, Tim? We don't we do not have it. it on the list. We have children that may try to run. Um, so the the playground areas we we feel is important. I, I hate to say <clears throat> to contain them, but but so that they don't go beyond. You know, the kids are running, 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 and having fun, or or deciding to explore. So we feel those from a safety perspective are very important. Um, from the basketball court perspective, you know, 
I don't think everyone's as good as Rupert or Ben, so um, they may miss the basket <laughs> once or twice and then go go in, you know, go have to go retrieve it, which is in the, the rain gardens. So we feel that those are probably uh, an important feature to keep as well. And so are the play areas closer to like the parking lot or the street? Because for me, this is something that seems a little bit strange just because none of our play areas currently have any type of fencing. Um, and so if it's fencing just around the play areas rather than the school, that seems slightly strange to me. Sure, um, you know, we could show you image, not today, but we can maybe get some images, but of, of what that might look like. But um, I think we would defer to Mike and Tammy and team if they feel fencing around it's the play structures, right? The playground, if they feel that they don't need them and, and that would be fine if they feel that they don't need them. It really is to protect the students from, from, uh, it, it's, and, it's been and, often, or, it's often been a request to have the playground that's for the younger kids to have a fence all the way around it. Uh, we've often done that. Um, yeah, Tammy has her hand up too. Um, so having gone to visit one of the sites that had more definition around the playground, it actually was really nice to see that, um, and sort of, at least to the eye, and then to add structure, particularly for people that are outside during recess duty, which includes teachers, their educators, and whoever else is out there, um, from the lens of safety, um, and having to have, you know, students that try to elope from the school grounds, to know that that measure is there would really help to alleviate a lot of stress that I know I felt and staff have felt um, by not having some type of barrier-like effect. I think, Margaret, we could go to the next category from what I'm seeing. Yep. Next category is the building envelope exterior of the building. Um, so we'll go through the list and then we have uh, video of the exterior of the building that will show you the impact. First item on the list is delete rain screen phenolic resin panels. This is uh, an exterior cladding system that we had at the stair at the south where the uh, bus drop off is and it's mirrored on the north side. Uh, the material just allows you to give a different texture, which we were using to mark entry, uh, but it is um, one of the items where we saw a very pronounced increase in cost, uh, and we feel that we can achieve the same thing, uh, contrast and color with a masonry material, so we've uh, eliminated that, um, and so that was a $200,000 item. The what, next item on the... Uh, we, we should be consistent. Maybe we... Uh, just say a word about direct cost, cost and total deduct, and always talk. Decide, Tim, that we're going to talk about the total deduct because it okay, that, No, it's a it's a substantial difference and a good point. Yeah, you're talking about almost thirty percent. So, um, with the markups, the total construction cost it's two hundred seventy three thousand dollars. So it is um, a significant um, improvement to the bottom line, and and we feel we can design the building and just as well without it. Um, uh, Tim, before you, Tim, before you go on, I guess just to reiterate what Rick was saying, I, I'm not sure we said at the beginning the difference between direct cost and total deduct. Um, if, if you look at the cost estimates, there's the actual cost of the work. So this would be the material, the laborers, the subcontractors that would come in to do the work, and then the general contractor and um, other necessary uh, general requirements, uh, conditions, escalation. Um, we have some contingencies built in there. So you take the direct costs and then you take all of the line item costs, percentages, et cetera, 
um, and add it to it. And those represent uh, approximately 29% of the direct costs. So, so the direct cost, if I, there are people out there looking at the cost estimates, that will help you take the unit costs that are associated with each of the items, but then that you can't stop there. You then have to add the 29% of what we're calling markups, but um, they're, they're also equally important in the, uh, for that, that's how the pricing occurs with the contractor. Moving to the next item, um, reduce overhang at the roof line at the media center and administration. If you recall, there was an overhang at the clear story windows. Um, you've just simply cut the depth of that in half. And once you add up the uh, material to frame it um, and the cladding that uh, when you reduce the depth of that, it's $195,000. Um, and we feel that there's uh, only a, a minor change in the design, so we accepted that. Uh, the next item is reduce the mechanical screen wall uh, that hides the equipment that's over the part of the gym and at the end of the library. Uh, with reducing the 50%, we could still block the view and have the same uh, visual appearance from the main entrance. And then the equipment may be visible from the bus loop in some areas but it's pretty far set back in the gym. So we don't feel that this is um, uh, anything that should be objected to. Um, delete horizontal accent mullions is the next item. Um, it's a, simply changing the depth of the vertical and horizontal aluminum elements in the curtain wall um, as a design feature. Uh, but this is another one of the items where the markup was considerable. Uh, since the last, so we've eliminated that, and that with markup saves seventy three thousand dollars. Yeah, if I could just uh, add a little bit uh, when we talked about unit costs going up again, that's so just plain windows was one of those items where we saw the estimators go from a hundred dollars a square foot for a window opening to 140 for actually a kind of a plain vanilla window and that's based on their experience so that's when we say we there's inflation in unit prices and then based on that there's a inflation multiplier that's down in those markups that's how uh, market conditions are affecting the cost of this uh, estimate if that's helpful Um, the next item on the list is to replace a spandrel glass, um, which is essentially the glass that was part of the curtain wall at the cafeteria and the media center. And we had a little at the music room, I believe, where the curtain wall system goes uh, essentially to the to the roof line. But the top panel was opaque um, just to complete the look. But um, that curtain wall um as Rick was saying, it's expensive. Curtain wall is now $180 a square foot in the estimate. So that was um, changed to a, a metal panel system. Um, and that saved uh, $60,000. Um, the next two items are both changing one type of metal panel for another. Um, essentially, a composite metal panel is two layers of metal with a, a layer of um, polyurethane between them. Uh, it gives you a very flat um, look, uh, a sleek look, but they're both replaced here with a single layer of metal that is um, very similar. Uh, and, and, you know, these are both materials that we have used before, but the cost systems have, have shown a, a dramatic increase between the two. So we switched to the brake metal. Um, and between the two items is there's a sixty thousand dollar item and a hundred and sixty thousand dollar item to replace it at the walls and at the fascia of the canopies. Uh, the next item is similar in flavor, but it's zeroed out because it's included in the above. Um, we did have this metal panel in various places, canopies, roof edges, uh, accent panels throughout the building. So there's yet one other line item where that 
switch is made. Um, so there's another one here for um, $90,000. The next two items are items that we do not recommend and therefore do not, but it's something that we typically think about. This one, one was replacing uh, windows and clear story at the gym with cow wall. It lets diffuse light in, but it is a polycarbonate or, or plastic material and there have been issues with it uh, deteriorating over time. So, um, and over time can mean less than 20 years. Um, and then the, the next item is to replace uh, a curtain wall at the cafeteria, essentially, in the gym with uh, punched openings. And we, at this point, think that that's too much of a design change. Uh, so we have not recommended that. The next item is to take the elevation of the second floor or the floor to floor height on the first floor and to reduce it by one foot. So that saves you the height of every wall in the building, one foot of exterior skin all the way around the building, um, which is a significant savings. Um, the only impacts are that there might be some localized reduction in ceiling height. Um, it would most likely be in the cafeteria. Um, but this is, um, we feel that we can still get the ceiling height necessary to make it uh, a usable public performance space uh, appropriate for the use of an elementary school. But there is um, undeniable savings here. So we have it on the list. And there's also um, less exterior wall where heat is lost and less window. So there will be a slight performance uh, gain in terms of energy. But it is a $350,000 item. So um, we have it recommended. Uh, Jonathan, I saw your hand go up. Uh, don't know if you want to comment on this one. It just, uh, you said one foot, but you're really doing two block courses or 16 inches. Correct. You are correct. This, thank you. Um, and I'll just put this in now. It, it, you know, it's worth the question of, uh, whether there are some other small reductions that could occur on the other, the other floors that would be an improvement or it would just be too incremental to, to make a difference. The other floor is at 14 feet floor to floor from second to third, and then 14 feet from uh, floor to roof would be very, very tough to reduce without absolutely having to cut ceiling heights and lowering ceiling heights impacts the depth of daylighting into the deeper into the space. Um, Jonathan, just kind of to to go back, um, the intent of the first floor, we by rate the reason why the first floor was higher than the other floors was solely to not solely, but to to gain height in the cafeteria. Um, so that's why we were originally doing that. But the the other two floors are kind of typical heights for classrooms. And we have maintained um, the offset at the media center on the second floor, which will allow the floor to floor height over the cafeteria to be one foot four higher than the rest of the difference in the building. So uh, we still have that in there. Uh, the next item, um, reduce the amount of curtain wall at the um, gymnasium as shown. Um, there is honestly uh, ample uh, glass uh, and a 30% reduction would still be ample. Um, so uh, we do recommend taking that. Um, it would, um, in our view, not really be noticeable from the inside of the gym in terms of the amount of daylight let in. So that's a $18,000 reduction. Uh, the next item is we replace the material um, at the base of the wall um, where the curtain wall meets the ground um, in certain areas and where uh, one of our materials was meeting the ground, we had a uh, precast concrete. Uh, we've uh, replaced that with ground face CMU, which is concrete block, which is uh, similar in durability, but uh, more cost-effective. There's another 
savings of eighteen thousand dollars there. So, so that's the or end. Si of the, yeah, that's the end of that, the. That is the end of the exterior. Uh, the next items are interior, uh, but I was going to shift to uh, a view of the exterior okay. uh, that we yeah, could look at. Yeah, that's what I was going to say. Yeah. So just to give people, again, a visual of what we're referring to. Um, starting from the entrance and moving around the building as we usually do, um, some of the metal panel decisions that we talked about um, would be the edge of the canopy here shown in orange, the um, music room above the windows, the roof edge the setback that we talked about would be here at the edge of the library and the clear story um, at the lobby uh, and these this model already reflects those changes. Uh, the phenolic resin uh, panel that we eliminated was in this area, uh, but we can have a similar uh, contrast in terms of color as we develop uh, with the masonry material. Um, yeah, the color palette uh, that we've been showing all along or the, in the direction that we've been moving in. Uh, is still achievable with all of the changes that we have made. The window area in the classrooms has not been reduced at all. Um, in general, no area has the window um, area been reduced other than the gym, uh, which is sh shown here when we get around to that. Um, here are the planter gardens that we were talking about earlier. Um, you know, how they are constructed and the quantity is something that we can discuss further. Um, and then as we come around to the south of the building, there's another area where the phenolic resin panel was shown and we can use a masonry material that was at the stair here. And then the screen roll reduction that we've mentioned is on top of the gym. So that's the very end of the equipment. Honestly, a lot of the bus loop, uh, the equipment is so far back on the gym that you may not be able to see it depending on final sizing. Uh, so, And this is the screen wall that would continue to be on the west side that would give you the same look from the front of the building that you have seen to date. Um, we feel that the changes uh, yield significant savings, uh, but in terms of durability, design intent, experience of the building, uh, everything has largely been maintained. Um, these are all, you know, uh, all the materials that we have specified, we have used in these projects before, but the the unit costs have jumped significantly that we, you know, we're looking for ways to make uh, replacements with uh, similarly durable, similarly useful materials. Any questions on that? That was super helpful, Tim, to have that those pointed out in the video. Thank you. I, I also think, um, I think what you just said is we're looking at the building with the changes for the most part. And um, my eye can not see them, which is is great because I've been showing this picture. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> I've been <laughs> I've been to several uh, things, so, um, so so I'll just make that statement. I th I think the amount of money you've saved by switching materials um, makes a lot of sense to me. Um, so I guess m what Margaret was originally asking is there anything we want to take off the list um, right now? Do we want to keep everything that's on the list on the list? Tim, if you want to bring up the list, are there any items that were potential? I don't think so. I think we, I think we were suggesting that we take everything, we, right? We suggested that we take 
all of them on the exterior. Uh, on the exactly. interior, there are a few potentials, but the exterior, everything that I mentioned, we are recommending. Um, uh, except for the replaced uh, curtain wall, it's single story exterior walls, right? Uh, which was zeroed out. Yeah. We uh, so any, anything with a value associated. Yeah. yeah. So, so there are some other items on the list that we do not recommend taking, um, but I don't know if anyone feels that we could continue to look at them. But we've, we, we think that to Kathy's point, we've really been able to focus on areas that we could reduce the, um, it's really the unit cost and the cost of the material have gone through the roof in the last six months. And that's why we're where we're at. Um, but it does not in the least reduce the overall look and feel of the building. So I think we should go to the next one, Donna, just because I'm worried about yeah, losing. I'm good. As long as everyone, I just, there were a couple of no's and we just wanted to make sure everyone was good with that. Um, we can move to the items on the interior of the building then. Um, again, there are mostly things we recommend, but there are a few that we have in the potential category. Um, First is um, there was some paneling as you make the turn from the corridors into the project areas. Um, we've looked at both um, reducing it and eliminating it. Uh, so we have no as eliminating it entirely and a yes for reducing it by 50% uh, and the images that will show reduce it by 50%, but there's essentially a, uh, a durable panel at the uh, entrance to the project areas that uh, we want to reduce that would save us uh, $30,000. We, we have a video for this, right, too? We do, yep. yeah. So some of these will be more evident and may take less words to describe once we get to the video. Mm -hmm. Uh, the next item is um, there are cabinets over the lockers in the project areas. We are re suggesting replacing a natural wood veneer finish with a plastic laminate finish, which either can look convincingly like wood or another color that would assist with wayfinding. Uh, but that would save $46,000. Uh, the next is reduce storefront at the library interior. Uh, there's a, basically a glass wall to the corridor. We are suggesting reducing that glass by 50%. There is enough daylight getting into the library and from the stair across the hall that we feel that this would be appropriate. Um, and then, you know, the glass and the frame for those glazing systems is, is as we keep saying, one of the items where the increases were really felt. So any place we can make a reduction there is going to help the bottom line. Uh, that has a $20,000 uh, uh line item associated with it um the next one is replacing the system not reducing the number but changing the system in the library from an aluminum frame to a painted hollow metal frame uh but given the low value for this particular because there's not much in that particular area we said no but we could always revisit that um the next item is to eliminate the tile Wayne Scott in all of the corridors. Um, we are in the PSR and the basis of design. We had tile to five feet in the corridors. Um, we would be replacing it in this item with uh, abuse resistant gypsum, uh, but that is still can be damaged. And you also introduce the cycle of painting into the maintenance of the building if you do not have a tile surface. Um, the item below that um, is instead of eliminating the tile completely, it's reducing the height from five foot to three foot six. Um, so we do recommend taking that change uh, for savings of $55,000. The next two items are a replacement of the paneling system that we had specified in the lobby and the cafeteria around the platform opening. We had a phenolic resin uh, panel system, which is um, very durable and uh, basically unlimited flexibility in terms of uh, visual expression, color, 
wood panel uh, look, uh, but we've replaced that with a, a, a veneer wood paneling, um, which is also very durable um, and quite lovely, uh, but it saves us uh, a good amount of money. So uh, $30,000 in the lobby and $17,000 in the cafeteria. And we do recommend um, accepting that change. The next item replaces the glazing around uh, the main stair that goes from the lobby uh, up to the media center uh, and then to the third floor that will allow a lot of daylight into the corridor and down to the lobby. Uh, it's currently, or at PSR, was specified as a fire rated glazing system. That's essentially laminated glass that is required around a stair enclosure to get the rating. Um, but it is an expensive system. Uh, this item suggests replacing it with a hollow metal and adding deluge sprinklers um, that would allow you to achieve the rating. The thing is that this is not technically allowed under current code, although it was under previous codes, but you can do this if you have approval of the local building commissioner. So there honestly should be a small asterisk next to this one, uh, but visually, uh, and maintenance wise, it's the same, uh, but it does require a conversation with the building commissioner, but it is a big ticket item. It's $338,000 after markup. So we feel it's worth having that discussion. Another- the, the, the Massachusetts building code allowed this and we did it up to 10, 15 years ago under the old Massachusetts code. The IBC required the actual UL labeled glass. And then as an alternative to that um, $338,000 savings, we could use the more expensive system and reduce it by 50%, which would still bring a generous amount of light into this space and, and still be a significant savings. But um, uh, we would like to pursue the first option uh, of, of, of the deluge and hollow metal system first for the greater savings and more light. Uh, but if not, the fallback would be $185,000 savings. Uh, the next item is to reduce the height of the tile in the multi-fixture bathrooms from floor to ceiling tile to stopping it at five foot two of the floor. Uh, so similar to the corridors, um, you know, you are introducing a cycle of painting and cleaning uh, above the tile height, but anywhere, you know, from five foot two low or in the bathrooms, it would still be as scrubbable, durable, and um, long lasting as the tile was before. Um, the next item is um, delete the, we had a recessed picture hanging system in the corridors, which we, um, and many of our projects is used to display student art, but it is um, in this estimate, a, a fairly expensive item. So there might be some addition of a tax strip or something like that, but we also still have in tackable surfaces at the lobby, at display cases in the project areas. So we feel removing this is acceptable. And that's a savings of $37,000. Uh, the next item is a change of the ceiling system that we had specified in the cafeteria. We had a perforated uh, metal panel with a sort of undulating wave in it specified that could give some texture. Um, but it, uh, the price that was uh, quoted in the estimates was uh, it was it was it was too high. Uh, so we're going to replace that with a, an acoustic panel architectural system that still um, gives visual interest, uh, still will create a great ceiling, but uh, saves $164,000. Um, similar to the ceiling in the cafeteria, we have uh, we have pro we have clouds in the project areas outside of the classrooms that were originally specified to be a combination of uh, a metal grid system, uh, a ceiling system, uh, and a combination of that and light fixtures. And we feel that we can accomplish very close to the same look and feel 
that will mark the spaces and give an opportunity to inform wayfinding with light fixtures alone. Uh, and to do it that way yields a savings of $123,000. Uh, the next item is one that we do not recommend. It's um, a replacement of the wood, uh, essentially athletic floor, gymnasium floor on the platform uh, with a straight linoleum floor. So um, if you were to do this, you would save uh, $20,000, but the um, the bounce, the softness, uh, the dance floor element on the platform would be lost. It would it would just be a linoleum floor on concrete. Um, this is one of the few that we don't recommend. Um, the next one is reducing the transoms between the classrooms and the project areas. This is listed as a no, but we actually have it modeled as a yes, uh, just because we know how important daylighting is. We wanted to uh, get your sense uh, before we added this, but it is worth $107,000, so it, it might be worth it. The next item is to delete the hardwood um, trim that we had detailed around all of these transoms, uh, but we feel that uh, a similar detail in gypsum and paint uh, would be acceptable um, and it would save $105,000. So we are recommending that. And then the next and last item on the interior of the building is to <clears throat> eliminate the kindergarten doors. Um, there, there are a lot of aspects involved in this. Um, to the, out, are, to the outside. Exterior, sorry. <laughs> yeah. They, yeah, no, no, yes. yes <laughs> exterior doors. Not, you can, you can check in, but you can never leave. <laughs> so all, all access would be from the corridor through the remaining door. Um, um, but, uh, you know, as we had it specified, it was egress only hardware and the door was there for, because the building, because the room, the net area is over a thousand square foot, you need a second exit by code. Uh, but that can, through various means, probably through uh, a sign that posts occupancies that is agreed upon by the building commissioner. Uh, and given that the intended use is never to have 50 people in the classroom anyway, uh, we could eliminate that door. And that would be a savings of $21,000 if you do that at all classrooms, but we would have to discuss the safety aspects um, and all of the other things that go along with it. Tim, Tim, just to add to that, um, we don't, it is our understanding, I should say, that you're not using, the kindergarten teachers would not be using that door for exit and entry, right? So it really is just from uh, an emergency egress purpose. The other thing that we noted is that it actually improves the sustainability aspect of the building because we don't have an, another door for um, air infiltration. So there are, as long as the, there's no intent to use it for uh, egress or, or for the staff to use it for students to come and go from the classrooms, which we discourage for lots of reasons. Well, not, not only that, Donna, if that was a programmatic intent to go in and out of each classroom to the play, playground, by code, you'd have to add an energy vestibule to those sure. spaces to do that. Yeah. So, so you know, um, there's actually a benefit uh, from a sustainability perspective to eliminate the doors. And there, and there may be a benefit from a security perspective uh, because those correct. doors become uh, potentially a target because they're sort of not on the most visible side of the building. So. Okay, so do you want to take us through the video, Tim? Yes. We're going to look at the lobby, the project areas, and the uh, media center again. Um, much of the lobby has not changed. Some of the materials um, 
nothing that you've seen here in terms of the paneling and the glass at the administration suite uh, or the glass at the cafeteria has been affected. The paneling that you see on the left here will has gone from a phenolic resin to uh, an actual wood paneling. Um, one of the large items that we're talking about is the glass around the stair. So this is what we're talking about. The two options were one to replace it with a different system that we would have to talk to the building commissioner about. The other would be to reduce this by 50%. Um, but the materials in the gym, the amount of glass going into the gym, the other ceiling conditions, the floor, um, there have been no changes to the basis of design. As we circle around the cafeteria, the amount of glass to the cafeteria uh, remains constant. Uh, Sorry about that. Tim, when you so. get to the um, portals of the project areas, maybe you can do yeah. that. Uh, I wanted to mention, so that the other area where you see paneling that would change would be around the stage. Um, and then here as you're on your right, as you're walking out of the building in this direction, we've changed that material. Um, and the way it's rendered, it, it already looked like wood, so uh, we don't feel that it's too much of a distinction. So here is one of the changes. So in previous iterations, this wood paneling at the entrance to the project area was rendered essentially to the door height of the toilets. Um, and the tile that you see on the left here went to five foot two. Uh, so we've reduced that 18 inches and we've reduced the uh, paneling at the entrance to the project areas to the same height. We still have a durable surface in the range of kids, backpacks and shoes, uh, but there was some savings there and we felt that we can still do what we have to do to keep the walls durable with people going through it. Um, so as you go into the project area here, um, you can see that the clouds are a little bit simpler and this is just an estimation of the size. There are lots of things that we can do with um, um, the fixtures to get the right look. This amount of glass over the classrooms is reduced. It shows the 40% reduction. Um, so the $107,000 associated with that change uh, that has not been taken in the current total would be added if we did not put back the glass that is shown um, here. And another change in the project areas is these cabinets above the lockers have gone from a natural wood finish to a plastic laminate finish. And as we develop the design, we can figure out what's most appropriate, whether it is a wood look or some other look. Uh, with plastic laminate, you have a range of um, expressions that are available. Uh, but just as a point of reference, uh, the glass over the central classroom in the cluster of three essentially went all the way. Um, so with a few breaks of this width, the glass went wall to wall in the project area. And this reduction is what you would be looking at if we were to accept that line item. Now moving into the cafeteria, uh, excuse me, the media center. There is a 50% reduction in the glass into the workroom included in that storefront reduction. Um, none of the exterior glazing has changed or the other materials in the library. And then as we circle around to look at the entrance wall to the library, it's a little and did we change the ceiling material? We did not change the ceiling in the library. We changed the ceiling in the project areas and the media center. But in the 
No, cafeteria. No, cafeteria. Not yeah, cafeteria. sorry. Cafeteria was a lot. Of, but we did not change. Yeah, not in the media center. We changed it in the cafeteria. And then the solid wall around the door looking to the corridor is a decrease in the amount of glass from the last iteration. But there is still uh, a considerable amount of glass that will allow natural light coming from the stair across the corridor or from the library itself to get uh, into the corridor. And from a program perspective, at that end of the building or the front of the building, there's the media center, the art and STEM classroom, and, and a couple of, there's a lit specialist room. So um, it's still equally important, but there's not project areas, students won't be gathering. They We could use the corridor for uh, project-based learning. So that's why we felt it was important to bring light in, but there's ample light still resonating into the corridors, which really are not used like the project areas. So I think that that's that, if anyone wants to open. <clears throat> yeah, any questions? I am not seeing any hand. Mike. 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 Can you go back to the list? Uh, and the picture is prettier, but um, can you go back to the list briefly? Not at all. So again, Kathy, um, the if you've been sharing these views, right, there's... there's yes, the, the views look the same. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So, right side, it's, can you find 10 things different? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, so if you could scroll up about the fire glazing. So um, I'm not an expert in this area. Certainly, you know, Rupert Ben know a lot more than me, but um, with the first of the options, um, I mean, I imagine fire-rated glass, not to be overly dramatic about it, but it, um, it's there so that if a fire occurs, it's a protective aspect. And so, um, you know, I don't know if you could speak to the difference between those one or yep. two VE options and yep. just any safety sure. considerations. No, no. So, so the original option um, and what we're talking about getting rid. So, fire rated glass, as we're calling, it, is it's a laminated glass with um, you know, sort of ceramic layers that essentially um, the the glass itself is fireproof. If there was a fire on one side given the rating of the glass, which is a function of the thickness, it would be one hour or two hours, depending on the rating before the fire got through the glass itself. What the larger item here is suggesting is taking that glass and replacing it with essentially normal glass, but installing sprinklers directly adjacent to the glass that um, will wash it sides. in the event of both sides. In the event of a fire, the, um, glass that would have been rated will essentially have a sheet of water on it at all times so you are protected by the same fire protection system that is protecting the rest of the building and before the I, I hate to use the word affordable but before the technology of the ceramic glass became affordable even though it's 350 dollars a square foot which is why we we're looking to get rid of it um <laughs> the um the uh the system that we're proposing it was the standard for a keeping the rating in a glass stair. There are some complications. You can't have a horizontal mullion because it would stop the flow of the water coming down, but we were not showing that anyway. So they both are fire rated. It's just one is done with the sprinkler and one is done with the well, glass itself. Well, it, it, you know, it's, it's... And that's really helpful. I, that's what I was gathering when you were talking before. I just think, you know, we hear about safety, obviously, that's in the forefront of everyone's mind. And I think that maybe I need to hear it again, but but I think it's a good thing both for me, but also for members of the public to hear um, about the different approaches that it's not leaving a hallway um, or a staircase uh, more vulnerable. It's trying to resolve a challenge in a different fashion. Um, so I didn't mean to belabor the point and, and you know, certainly I didn't mean to cut you off, Rick, either. If you want to jump in, but I just thought that was a really important uh, point to make. I'm sorry, Rick. Well, just the fire rated glass 
by the code is actually considered a wall because it carries a rating where the old way of doing it, it was protecting the opening. It was considered an opening in the wall. So that option of protecting, protecting an opening in the wall was lost when we, the building codes changed, but that's the difference between the two approaches. Jonathan has his hand up. So I, my question is related to that, that same item. Um, while I would love to net that full change, um, prudence suggests, and unless you've had in the last 10 years, uh, uh, successfully argued this with a, with a building inspector, um, uh, I would, I would, you know, just for conservatism, I would carry the other option, even though I would prefer to have more glass um un until you can uh until you have the time to to walk this through with with our inspection services here in town um because it, if given the change if if you haven't if you don't if you don't have some if you haven't successfully pulled off this this alternate approach lately um i i would prefer to con carry a more conservative number we we have pulled it off in the last year okay uh with, and that was getting both the fire department and the building commissioner to sign off on it. Okay. But it was a different building type. Ah. Well, yeah. I would encourage you to have that conversation early. <laughs> so, so what we can do, Jonathan, I guess, I guess you're right, because this is, um, it's not something we can say, let's just take, maybe what we'll do is we'll carry the lesser number at the end of this. And then set up a meeting with the building commissioner to review this and the kindergarten classroom doors. That was um, Donna so and Tim, I was gonna suggest just what John, Jonathan did. And I think the simple way is you change the 50% the to yes and the other one to potential, you know, as opposed, and you're not taking it. Um, I also, I wanted to talk about the transoms um, where you didn't take it. Um, I think uh, I agree with not taking it, Tim, um, in, uh, outside the project areas as I, uh, or, or you took 40%. My question was, did the picture we just say, did it already have the 40% removed? The picture we saw did have the 40% removed. Okay, because I, I think those transoms are really important for the light that's coming into the project area. So as long as, as long as we continue to have that. Um, so I think those were my, that was my only comment on it. And the things you didn't take, I agree with not taking. <laughs> so And so there's not anything, at least there's nothing I see on your list I would take off. So I'll stop talking. Phoebe's hand is up. Um, I, uh, might question removing the exterior kindergarten doors. Um, I'm thinking, um, in some type of, of emergency, those are the kiddos that ultimately, um, may be the most nervous, not having to navigate, um, interior hallways at a time like that might be, um, prudent. <laughs> um, and if that is a uh, sticking point for the committee, then I would love to see, um, because I just am not envisioning it right now, what that walk looks like, just you know, normal for the kindergartners to come through the hallways and out the doors, how close they are, um, those kinds of things. Um, that was just my first sort of thought on that. I, I think um, the kiddos being anxious about not being able to um, exit the building quickly in case of an emergency, I, I, I'm not sure that that's the first thing on their mind, right? It, it, as long as there's a path and and the staff, I'll defer to Tammy and Mike on that. I think I think they're the ones really to respond to that. Um, we've had kindergartens on several of our buildings on the second floor. So, so there is no second means out, right? Like straight up, like they're on the second floor. So it is um, absolutely doable. And if this was 
a hundred square feet. No, uh, yeah, a hundred square feet smaller, uh, Phoebe. There would be no exit. There, actually, there would be no requirement. Actually, 50, 50 square feet, right, Tim? Fifty. Yeah, fifty square feet smaller. The the, the there, door there would, would not be, be required no. by code. Right. Right. So there there would be no. So. Um, you know, if it was a general classroom, we wouldn't be putting, we wouldn't even be considering this. We wouldn't be having this conversation. So I don't know if Tammy and Mike want to chime in on that. Mike. Yeah, I can just speak briefly, which is, I mean, I think the key thing is whether it's going to be used just for egress or for regular use, right? Regular use, because kindergartens do outside a lot. I get it. But what I, I thought I heard earlier was that if we're going to use it for regular use, then there's a whole bunch of other factors um, that are supposed to go into it. So, you know, Tammy and I can go back and have some conversations with, you know, folks who directly work in kindergarten and, and maybe bring that back to the next meeting. I think that'd be kind of wise. But um, if it's simply just for emergency egress and we're not using it on a regular basis, I, I agree. I don't think kindergartners are thinking of emergencies in the same way adults are thinking of emergencies. Um, but, uh, you know, for me, the sort of upside when I saw the doors originally was that, you know, we, we, our kindergartens, we do want them outside more often, but it's, that's not the primary purpose of the door, especially as we live in New England and, you know, all the other components of it. And then the safety features, which I think Rupert may or may not be raising his, raising his hand for, but, you know, having more doors in and more doors out, you know, uh, I think folks who are interested in safety would advise us to have to reduce the number of ways in, that's a uh, positive safety development in terms of um, the structure of the building. So, you know, but Tammy and I, you know, certainly can connect and, and try to talk to people who are working in kindergartens and get back to. So Rupert, I think Tammy does not have her hand up. So I'm gonna call on Rupert. Sure, I, I like to, to support removing the doors for both security purposes and energy purposes. And also just to point out that if the doors are there, people will want to use them and that will create other issues for us. Uh, so that's my position. That's my perspective at the moment anyway, open to hearing other perspectives. Okay, I'm not seeing other hands on that, but. Um... So um, Margaret, I just need to do a time check. It's 1025, yep. um, it's 1025. And I had posted this as going to 11, but I don't, um, my, uh, I know, Sean had to leave and Paul said he might have to leave. So just can everybody stay until 11? Um, okay, so I'm seeing nodded heads. That's that's all. So we can try to get through this list. That'd be great. Thank you. If there are no Angelica further questions. Angelica also has to leave. Okay. Angelica, uh, when do you need to leave? I just need to head off by in any minute, 10.30. Okay, so let's see how much we can get through. We st we will still have a quorum. Um, if we lose too many more people, we won't. But so we'll keep going. Sorry. Uh, we're going to move to the mechanical systems. There are only two under straight mechanical and one is plumbing. But um... Sorry, Rupert still has his hand up. Rupert, are you good? Yeah, he just didn't okay. put it. Okay. Uh, the first is to, we have uh, sensor faucets uh, specified and we were replacing them with uh, mechanical meter faucets, meaning you press a button and the water stays on for a certain amount. Um, and checking back through our meeting notes, that was actually Rupert's stated preference. So I don't think he would object, but you are in fact touching uh, the faucet, which you wouldn't fit with the sensor uh, faucets and fixtures, uh, but it does, yield a savings of $34,000. So uh, it is on the list. The other item under mechanical is a large item. Um, and we just want to explain how this works. So the chilled beams, the terminal units for the heating system uh, have four pipes going to them. It's a return for hot and cold water. So at any time, if the thermostat in the room tells the units they can be heating, they can be heating or they can be cooling regardless of what the units in the next room are doing. So all of the rooms function independently. Um, a, a typical cost savings item is to replace it, that four pipe system with a two pipe system uh, where the entire building would either be heating or cooling 
we are not suggesting that. We are suggesting putting a valve station in each room that will make each room able to heat or cool individually, but not the individual terminal units within each room. So any classroom can either be heating or cooling. So in a hypothetical situation where on the north side of the building, all of the classrooms were in a heating mode in the winter, but they might actually be in a cold cooling mode in the winter soil season because there's a lot of sunlight coming in, that is still on the table. But because you've eliminated a lot of piping um, and piping is one of those very expensive items now, uh, this yields a, um, a savings of $580,000. Um, and, and we recommend taking it. There is some additional complexity, uh, moving parts. Um, this is one is really to Rupert. Uh, but the system will perform the way it would if it was a complete floor pipe system and rejected heat from rooms that you are cooling can still be used to um, add heat to the system. So functionally, it's the same, but there are more moving parts and complexity. So those are the two items we have under mechanical and uh, probably um, I would think the floor is Rupert's for this. Um, and he has his hand up. <laughs> and I've unmuted already before being recognized. Uh, <laughs> so, uh, Tim, my understanding would be in a four pipe system, you would have a heating valve and a cooling valve at each chilled beam. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, when we change to this model, we would still have a heating valve and a cooling valve, but it would be for the entire room and it would be located maybe in the hallway or something. Is that? What we're talking that is about. correct. You would still have the four pipe system in the corridor. You would still have hot and cold and return in the corridor. But then that valve, rather than being at each terminal unit, would be, I, I don't know whether it would be in the classroom or on the corridor side of the wall. Uh, but yes, you would be consolidating valves, essentially. So, the, so net result, there would be less piping inside the classroom and potentially a net res reduction in control valves? Or would it be the same number of control valves? Uh, you would be re removing the valves at the units, but they might be integral with the unit and replacing it with a separate valve station. So mm -hmm. I, I guess technically the, the total number of valves would go down, but the items in the system may go up. I mean, uh, re this is definitely worth a, a, a conversation with our engineer. To, mm -hmm. to, to fully make sure that you are comfortable with everything that is involved, uh, but 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 we do so, recommend it. Yeah, no, I was prepared to dig my heels in on a two pipe system until I got the explanation. So thank you very much. I appreciate that. Um, it does seem like it has possibilities for us. Um, my main concern probably would be how easy we can make it to get at the control valves, mm -hmm. uh, to service and replace them. Uh, how much space will you be able to give them to, and what height will they be at so that we can we can work on? Them. Uh, yeah, those, I mean, those I, are sort of uh, minor questions and concerns, I think, compared to overall. Um, I'm I'm shocked at the at the change in pricing, but you know, I guess we all are. So, well, if yes. if you if you were to put the valve station just inside the classroom wall, for example, example. So you would be accessing the valve uh, above a, what's our ceiling height, 10 four, Tim? Yes. Above it, from a ladder, uh, above uh, lay-in acoustic ceiling that's at 10 feet four above the floor. So it could be, I don't know, 11 feet. Right. 11 and a half feet yeah. through, uh, through a opening in the ceiling and we could have some removable grid so that there's more room around it. Nice, nice. Um, and presumably the um, the chilled beams are up high anyway. Right. Uh, so it, it doesn't change needing a ladder to work on the valves. Yeah, it would be about the same situation uh, if the valves were at the, the chilled beams. In right. terms of access and what you needed to get to them. Yep. Yep. I guess I would want to think about uh, desirability of putting the valves, valve access in the hallway, 
so that we could work on systems while kids were in the classroom. But mm -hmm. the corridors are still a, a concern. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. This, um, um, and, and also be right with the same. Yeah. So we we th uh, Jonathan, you have your hand up. Do you want to add to it? Yeah. There, I think I've managed to unmute myself. Uh, I don't want. I yeah. I, I, I'm glad to leave most of this review between the design team and Rupert, um, but only wanted to add that you know both this category and the next one, electrical. You know, these are often very high ticket items, and so you know as we move forward. Um, it's it's an area where we just want to make sure we're always kind of keeping our, our pencils as sharp as possible. I know you're going to do that, um, but uh, there you know if there are additional savings that that develop as as the review goes on, I'm sure the, the committee as a whole would, would love to see some. Yeah, and I think just just to that point and what Tim was saying, we were incredibly surprised by the change in the unit costs. Um, and, you know, for example, piping, right? So for us, this was unbelievable. Um, if we had known at the very beginning of this whole conversation that, there, that, that we were putting a $500,000 added cost to the project, um, we never would have suggested it to begin with. But it, it was, it's just where materials are right now. And that... Um, there are certain ones that are carrying extreme premiums, but this this cost wasn't yielding this uh, savings or, or this effort wasn't yielding the savings earlier. So I just don't want anyone to think that we were not designing the most cost effective system in the past. No, it's a it's a mar market change that's going to result in design intentions changing going forward. I, OK, let's keep going. Keeping an eye on the time here. Um, I don't expect a resolution on that, so we can move into the electrical um, line items, um, which are also a bit in the weeds, but uh, we can go through them and, and see if there are anything that anyone objects to. Um, the first three are all adjusting the scope of lighting fixtures. One is within the building, uh, the way uh, that it was costed at this time. We, we, we did a layout, but the layout was conservative and based on other projects. Uh, so we feel that without too much effort, we can reduce the total scope of the interior lighting package by 10%, either through a reduction or a change in the type of fixtures. Um, the same uh, similar uh, concept for exterior lighting, exterior lighting broken out into two separate items, which is one, the parking lot and the driveways. And also there's a series of poles for pedestrian lights around uh, the building. And in both the parking lot and the pedestrian poles around the building, uh, we have them closed pretty basically, and we haven't had a full discussion about what the appropriate light levels are. So we're fairly confident that we can um, either reduce the spacing or the number of fixtures to yield some savings there. So we um, recommend taking those items. It's uh, 140,000 in the building and an aggregate of 40,000 outside the building. Uh, the next item is just uh, a reduction in the size of the switchboard to 3000 amps. There's only feeders for 3,000 amps in the building. So there is really no reason to have a 4,000 amps loop bar other than future expansion, which um, is still accommodating. Is, yes, which we still have room for. So um, we feel that this is an easy one to take at $83,000. Um, the next ones are to change from copper feeders to aluminum feeders. Um, the copper is sort of the standard, but Aluminum is allowed by code, and there is uh, certain data that it performs well in certain um, areas like expansion and oxidation. Uh, so we feel that um, using them is uh, perfectly acceptable, um, unless we have any uh, comments from Rupert or the facility staff. But there are savings of 16,000 um, for the secondaries, and then for the generator, there's another 36,000 in savings. I was kind of surprised that this number was so small, but I assume that means the cost of aluminum has gone up a lot. Uh, the cost of aluminum, yeah, unfortunately, that is reflected in our window number. So I guess we can't yeah. get the savings here and then the savings exactly. as well. Yeah. 
and everyone's switching to aluminum because copper is <laughs> so expensive. Right? You can't use it. <laughs> cost prohibitive, right? Yeah. Um, we had fairly generous allowances for uh, sound systems in the cafeteria and uh, the gymnasium, uh, seventy-five and eighty-five thousand dollars. We feel that we could cut that uh, by seventy thousand dollars and and still provide a system that is more than adequate for the level of performance and audio requirements uh, in both spaces. Uh, we do recommend taking that. So what you're going to keep in is 75 and 85, and that represents taking out 70. Is that right? It represents taking out 70 of the combined 75 plus 80. So it would be it. Um, 90 between the two. So it would be 45 for each system. OK. Um, the next is to remove the concrete duct banked around the um, conduit for the feeders on site from the generator. So you would end up with a direct buried PVC conduit, which is um, perfectly acceptable. It's just a matter of uh, what the facility standards are. Uh, in case in concrete is durable, it prevents against anything that could happen, but direct buried PVC is acceptable. That would yield $40,000. Um, the next item, the future uh, duct bank for the athletic field lighting comfort station. It's a matter of changing the routing. Instead of going from the street, it would go to the transformer that's already on site. It would still be separately metered from the school, uh, but you'd be saving some lengths. Um, so there would be a savings there of $80,000. Uh, the next is to delete electric hand dryers that we had shown in the multi-fixture toilet rooms and the staff toilet rooms. Um, the, you know, obviously we have to have the complete conversation on what the school wants in terms of trying to, whether it's paper towels or we, I don't think we ever came to a complete closure on that discussion, but if we do eliminate them from the design, that's uh, $56,000. Um, and then in line with school policy and the desires of Amherst in terms of what they want in terms of interior cameras, we have reduced the numbers that were shown on the SD drawings. Uh, both exterior and interior remaining only at the entrances, at the large public spaces, there were some cameras that were shown in the corridors and on the upper floors that were removed. Uh, so in aggregate, that takes out um, $87,000. Um, and then we also, there's another line item for the cameras in the parking lot, uh, which is another $50,000. Uh, so all of this needs to be reviewed with the school and uh, public safety. But uh, from what we've heard so far, this puts the number of cameras more in line with what we've heard of what uh, is acceptable to the town. And that is the list. And we don't okay. have any pictures for any of that. Exactly. Uh, no. <laughs> any, any comments on any of those before we toggle? We'll just... Rupert has his hand yes, up. Yes, Rupert, sorry. Of course I have comments. Um, uh, most of these make sense to me. There's a couple of concerns. Um, uh, as I understand it, the uh, feeders from the transformer and from the street are going to be going underneath parking lots and roadways, driveways. Um, and so my personal feeling is the the added risk uh, that aluminum conductors have for uh, getting degraded and failing um, is too high. Um, and so I would like to suggest that for the feeders, we want the more durable, more longer lasting, more reliable copper. Um, and uh, but uh, yeah, direct berry PVC, no problem. Um, 3000 amp switchboard, no problem. All the lighting things, no problem. Um, I guess the only other one that, that I would 
rather not see is uh, eliminating the paper towel dispensers. I mean, adding paper towel dispensers. I think that that the operating costs for that um, over time with labor and materials um, makes it really not worth it, um, in my opinion. Uh, I'll stop there. Ben, you you had your hand up and then took it down. Did Rupert answer your question? Rupert kind of stole my thunder. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Well, the good news is the two of you think alike. I see Phoebe's hand up. So I just want to clarify um, and make sure that I didn't misunderstand what you were saying. Removing the um, athletic field duck bank system trying to read exactly what you have here um so that's not like we would still have electrical and plumbing run to what will potentially be a future you know comfort station or whatever we're calling it um that's just running it differently that we had than we had originally anticipated if i can yes. just get clarification on that okay yeah so it, it, it says remove it but it, it it should say remove and replace so instead of um going from the athletic portion of the site directly west to the street, it goes to the transformer, which is on site by the uh, parking lot. Uh, so at, so that reduction in connections and linear distance saves some money. And, and there is no future plumbing. As for the plumbing component of the comfort station, the last discussions were that it could be composting type toilets and not have plumbing. So we're, there is no plumbing component for future in this estimate. So I'm not seeing any other hands up with questions. So I think we changed a few of these to potential, but I didn't hear people taking anything major off the list. Um, so, Here's my suggestion, since I know we have some other things we're going to have to get through pretty quickly. Margaret, I don't think we're going to have time for you to do the overall today, but you can say how quickly you can do it, um, is that people take this list. I know we none of us had very long to look at this, and I have a couple, at least one thing that's not on the list, but I'll just wait till next week. Um, and if you have any other items, if you send them through to me, you know, by Monday or Tuesday, I'll make sure I get them to Danisco. Um, Cause some of these have been easy for them to estimate. Some of them have been a lot of extra work. I mean, the easiest is when we just eliminate one of the line items. Um, so, but I do, um, I see Jonathan's hand is up, but I do want to find out about next Friday. And so I will probably just use a poll because I think it's an important Next, having a meeting next week is important. So I just want to make sure we can make sure we have enough people there who would want to be there. And I'll, I won't take time to do that today, um, but I've got at least three people who said they can't be there next week. So um, I'll stop. So I see both John, Jonathan has his hand up and I don't know whether Rupert put his hand back up again. Yes. Okay. So Rupert and Jonathan. Oh, I just, uh, regarding the... Um... Direct burial PVC conduits. Uh, the code would allow um, non-direct burial cables inside the conduits. As a as a precaution, I would recommend having DB rated wiring inside the PVC. It still should be a net savings on the uh, on the overall cost. Thank you. Uh, and my comment was more just to thank the design team for the thoroughness of. The materials they had to present today this is a difficult thing to get through um, even if we have two or three meetings to do and i found this very a very helpful way to present the the complex cost information and the, and the the long matrix of of items that we have under consideration so yeah and i just i want to second that and also for people who wish they had gotten them a week earlier one the the reconciliation that happened last Thursday was eight plus hours. And then the work went on all weekend, Monday and Monday to get us this list. Um, it, as you can see, it wasn't just a strike this one. So 
I want to thank you for the extraordinary amount of extra work that just went on. Thank you very much, because this bringing us the $10 million oh dear list with a, here's some things we can do about it was extremely helpful. Um, wow. Well, knowing knowing what goes into this. this. <laughs> none, of, none of this is pleasant for any of us. Um, and, and I even think, Margaret, um, you know, even the cost estimators, we were all equally um, shocked by the increase in six months. And I think some of it, what you'll see again in the overall cost estimate is we're still carrying a high escalation rate because we just don't know when this is going to end. So yeah. uh, it's just a stinky time to be um, in this market. Uh, Margaret, can we wait on the invoices till next week? Do we have time to wait on the invoices? Uh, uh, we can wait on the invoices till next week, in my opinion. Um, the I it's ten forty nine, and I'm a guessing we have some public comment. I think we Wait, also so need to wait it. on the presentation of the total project budget. So um, I just want to quickly flash up on the screen a reminder about um, what's coming. So just going back to the agenda. So <clears throat> we're going to meet next week at some point TBD um, to look to to sort of kind of wrap this up. And at that point, I will talk about the total project budget, which includes the soft costs. Then we have the community forums coming up. Um, then um, on the 27th, we have an opportunity to meet again to con to sort of further hopefully finalize this discussion and talk about the feedback from the community forum. There is also a February 3rd, I'm not, not wanting to add meetings, but I will say there is also a February, February 3rd Friday, which is not shown here. But the next meeting after this one that's scheduled is February 10th, at which point we would be looking, we would need to have, by this point, I would say the 27th to Alicia's comment question, we would need to have finalized the cost because then the team is assembling the schematic design document, which would be shared with you for this February 10th meeting. And then we have the scheduled vote to submit it on the 17th. The following week is school vacation week. So that's probably our last, the 17th, probably realistic early, our last chance to get together before the submission has to be sent into the MSBA. So um, that is kind of the overview. Margaret, just if I could just quickly add, um... MSBA requires this V list, uh, whether we take the uh, alter the alternates or the um, substitutions. So this list, whether it's they're accepted or not, we will continue to carry the items that we don't accept. Um, as the design continues, we'll continue to add items to the list as well. Um, just as as the design continues, we may look start be able to start looking at things alternatively or in a different way. So, the the list just because they're nose now doesn't mean it's gone or forgotten. We'll continue to carry those, and then based on people's uh, responses, other considerations, we can add those to the list going forward. So this isn't the end all, I guess, is what I'm trying to say. Yeah, and as Mike pointed out, uh, and it, that. As we go through the process that we're going to continue have check ins on the estimate so it's this is a model for how we will are likely to discuss the cost of the project as each phase wraps up so. So at that point, I think if there's public comment that's what we need to toggle to I'm so. not seeing any other hands up so we are open for public comment and um, I see. Uh, to um i'm in control i think so i'm going to bruce i have allowed you to talk if you unmute and i would ask that each of you keep it short but we welcome any written comments bruce uh i will keep it short first i think really important to echo what jonathan and you kathy said about this process and denisco and margaret and so forth it's really quite phenomenal i'm very pleased to have received all this stuff. And I, I think the way Tim and Donna and uh, Rick, uh, Richie facilitated the discussion is also noteworthy because it really was a long 
complicated list and it's a big committee and there's others out there as well. So congratulations on that. I am going to send you Kathy a written thing, so I'm not going to say too much now. But um, I did have a question that I will put on the list, but uh, I wonder whether we're able to use PEX. Uh, you, you've talked repeatedly about the cost of piping. And uh, 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 so we're not able to use uh, PEX instead of type L copper. Uh, Tim's not shaking his head. So that's unfortunate, I think, uh, but maybe we don't have to get into conversations about that. I will send uh, my other lists uh, to you, Kathy. Uh, I've got a few comments and thoughts about how we could reduce site work. Uh, so thank you all very much. Thank you. Okay. Um... Rudy. Rudy, we heard, heard you for a second and then you disappeared. Let me just see. I think Rudy, right. how's that? There we go. Yeah. Excellent. I, I, I just wanted to also thank the design team. I thought this was phenomenal work. Uh, uh, I might have re removed you. Um, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> I'm, I'm, as I'm, I won't I'm, take I'm, it personally. <laughs> um, no. so, one more time. Thanks to the design team. I, I just thought this was phenomenal work and phenomenal presentation. Thank you so much. I'm glad we have you on the case. Um, if you add fencing to the list of the grid of possible cuts, I think it might be useful to split it into two or three fencing parts, the basketball separately from the four foot fencing around the playground areas. And maybe between the two playground areas, if, as I recall, the youngest kids are in the area closest to the driveway and, and parking, um, I could see that you might make a decision to keep that fencing, but delete others. So maybe break those out three ways. Um, thanks so much. I'll probably send some written comments, but that's it. Thank you, Rudy. Maria. Here we go. Okay. Maria, you should be able to talk. All right. Yep. So um, I'd like to make a suggestion for uh, Kathy uh, and the Denisco team. Given the, the volume and complexity of the materials that we're dealing with and the number of people who would want to have input between building committee members and interested members of the public, can I suggest that um, all of the comments, um, including what the NISCO has presented and what you receive, is put into a master document, perhaps organized by um, the, <clears throat> the cost estimates, so that we can understand uh, the recommended changes, questions, suggestions, and answers by DENISCO on each of the items, um, and that that may be made available prior to uh, the next meeting, if people can get that into you as soon as possible uh, to make the next meeting more productive. Uh, Mike, I had some specific questions about something that wasn't addressed today, and that's about uh, given your surprise at the increase in unit prices, um, upon what are you basing the change uh, or are the cost estimators basing their change in escalation, which only went from eight to nine percent from the uh, PSR to these, um, and is that sufficient? I also noted that the design contingency dropped uh, considerably from 12 down to 7.5%, and I know that that is normal for that to decrease as the uh, process continues as you get deeper into more details of design, but is that, um, I, I want to hear more about that and whether that is a, a, a reasonable assumption. and. Um, it, I found it interesting that general conditions did not um, change much from Fogarty. It only went from 3.3 million down to 3.2 million. Uh, and for PMNC, uh, it increased from 2.6 to 3.4 million. And I'd like some more information about, uh, again, with the uncertainties uh, that we're facing, what are the anticipated impacts on labor um, as we get to the, uh, as we get to hopefully um, uh, construction of this uh, next year. Thank you. I'll send lots more written in, uh, comments. Thank you. Um, so if, if people 
I will take on a consolidation of comments that I get. Um, and and uh, we, we sort of have a summary of what we discussed today. So I think we're ready for the next week, uh, other than finding a time for us to meet. And again, I just want to thank, well, I want to thank everyone for staying longer today, but also just to thank you for bringing us um, a long list with um, that added up to more than a small amount of money. I, I think that was a gift to us. So I think um, Donna, your hand is up, but I was mm -hmm. going about to say the meeting is adjourned. So oh, I just I just want to say that um, I think what we'd like to do, hopefully, um, is reach out to the building commissioner, uh, maybe talk about the soils, try try to. I know next week's a short week, but if there's a way to engage some folks so that so that we can at least report back um, whether some items are available or, or or some of these reductions are possible or not. Okay, so we, I, I will I'll work with Paul on that um, you know, on on both those Perfect. two pieces. Thank you. So I think uh, I'm not seeing any other hands up. So I am going to say the meeting is adjourned at 10.59, which means we adjourn by 11. So that's great. Thank you, everyone, very much. Have a good rest of your day.